why the love of that era of comedy, the classic comedians? What- well, just accidentally, you know, I, when I was living in Canada, I started doing stand-up in Toronto in late 1998. Okay. I moved to Vancouver in 2001, and I did it there until 2006. Um, but because I was into comedy, I was like, going to record stores, I'd find comedy records, Smothers Brothers, whatever, and I'd buy them. And so it was through those comedy records that I started to get like context for the history of comedy. I, there was a record store that was going out of business when I moved to Toronto called Peter Dunn's Vinyl Museum. They had thousands and thousands of records, and because they were going out of business, everything was like a dollar. And they had all of these comedy records from people I'd never heard of. And most of them, when I'd flip them over, it would say, recorded live in Miami Beach. Recorded live in Miami Beach. And they're all from the early 60s. And I was like, what? what's going on in Miami Beach? <laughs> yeah, Why yeah, are yeah. all the... Com- and they're all really obscure. And some of them would say, adults only. And you would listen to it. And they'd use words like knockers. She had big knockers. <laughs> and it'd be like, not for radio play, you know? And so I just found that all so intriguing and fascinating. So that's where the interest started. It wasn't okay. even that I found these people particularly funny. I just found them fascinating. There was a record I found by a real obscure guy named Alan Gale, and it said, uh, recorded live at Jack Silverman's International Celebrity Club. (laughs) And it it doesn't even open with comedy. It opens with like a, a fanfare of a band and a big drum roll. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your entertainer. Alan Gale, and he has bum bum da 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 da, and he goes, oh, wonderful audience, wonderful audience, bottle of champagne for this table right here, bottle of champagne, <laughs> bottle of champagne for this table right here, and it's like he's not doing any jokes, but this is how he opened his act. <laughs> right. I just found it completely fascinating. Sure. you know, it sounded like a real life Tony Clifton type of lounge act, right? And so that's where my fascination came from. I was like, who are these people, and what is this universe? And so the first person that I ever interviewed for that website, who I tracked down, was a guy named Woody Woodbury. Mm. And he had like 20 comedy records, and they were in every record store, and uh, he had, I don't think I'd ever seen him on TV or in a movie or anything. And I found a very uh, low-budget, like, Angel Fire website that looked very bad and lo-fi, but with an email address, and I emailed him. And he was in his 80s, and he, and he said, yeah, we'll do an interview. And so I talked to him over the phone, I interviewed him, and while I had him on the phone, I went through my record collection. I'd be like, who's Alan Gale? He'd go, oh, Alan Gale was older than grass. I'd be like, well, who's, who's this guy? Harvey Stone. Worst nose job in showbiz. Like he knew every guy. Right. And all the stories were interesting. And so I found out or I discovered that these guys' lives were sort of interesting and funny, even when their act wasn't. And right. Jack Carter is the best example of that. Yes. Never laughed at his act. Ever. Everything he said to me off stage, hilarious. On stage, he was like a gentleman going, you know, he would close with a song, you know, I love to entertain, without you I'm nothing. And then he would get off stage and go, those motherfuckers gave me nothing. Like he would just like <laughs> rant and rave. And his anger off stage was so funny and it was the exact opposite of his on stage right. persona. So, I mean, that's sort of how it got into it. Uh, speaking of Jack Carter, I alluded that we were having a conversation off the air before we uh, got back in, uh, but you were recording. Mm-hmm. So we're going to, we're, we'll tag that at the end. Yeah. Uh, uh, we started talking about Jack Carter, and I've told the story about me at the Bud Freeman Roast, yeah. which I may have told on the show before, but I don't know if I told it in that kind of detail I don't before. think you ever, yeah, there was part uh, of it that I didn't, wasn't familiar uh, But I, I'm to the point now that I, I just don't care. Yeah. And uh, I may have been uh, saving some of the stories. I've been, maybe pulled my punches on that story in the past of not uh, revealing what everybody had said, uh, but it... Um, uh, it'll be at the end uh, of this episode. We'll tag that on with the... Uh, That's uh, incredible that you got to experience that, though, that the fact that Red Buttons and Jan Murray and Jack Carter are still alive, and you have, like... You well, pro- this is 20 years ago. But that's still kind of cool that you straddle these two generations mm-hmm. uh, uh, right at the tail end of those guys' uh, careers, and, basically. And, and, and spoiler, people know a little bit of the story. The, the great part about it, again, and I, t- I, I mentioned this before, was that they bonded with me. Like, mm-hmm. they, they liked my style of comedy, which really was flattering to me because I grew up watching those guys and yeah. kind of emulated that style of mm-hmm. comedy. Mm-hmm. Certainly at that time, maybe not so much anymore, but certainly 20 years ago, I kind of had that, you know, the uh, kind of a, the Rat Packy vibe to me. For or sure, the, yeah. Or the old, you know, uh, uh, you know, Norm Crosby's comedy shop sort of, you know, <laughs> uh, vibe, which is painfully unfunny. But, uh, but I love Norm as a... So when he... Uh, embraced me that night and to your point of straddling both of having both Bob Saget and Norm Crosby say that you know you're the funniest guy that I've seen in ages like meant the world to me yeah and uh and Red Buttons that night was and I've told this before and I, I, I apologize to the list of variant so he went last and Earthquake you know the comedian Earthquake uh he was on the dais and Earthquake 
so everybody's making jokes about uh, one of my jokes was something about Roseanne, and then you know, uh, blah blah blah. I just got to fuck Roseanne, and then Tom's like, "Well, I can give you her number," and so then other guys then t- called back to that, and Earthquake did a thing about how he. Um, uh, he just fucked Roseanne. He was just, he's sorry, he was lady, he just fucked Roseanne, or whatever. So then Red Buttons, again, dying. He's dying in front of our eyes. <laughs> gets on, you know, please welcome Red Buttons. And he gets up, and, and we're like, well, what's this going to be? Yeah. And he's killing. Like, his jokes are phenomenal. He's, you know, he never got a dinner. He's doing all that stuff, his classic. And then he gets to, he gets, uh, he goes down, and he goes, an earthquake is here. And he goes, I just learned I fucked a guy who fucked Roseanne. <laughs> And the place goes, I mean, it, it was an explosion of, and like Saget and me, like we couldn't stay in our seats. Like we wanted to jog around the room. But that's the energy that that joke gave us because nobody saw that joke coming. Yeah. So wonderful. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, and he just, every time he would get a big laugh from me and Saget and Kindler, he would just, he would turn to his wife and he'd go, the young guys love me, honey. <laughs> and he meant it. Like it truly meant yeah. something to him yeah. that, we, that we were enjoying. And we weren't faking it. He was wonderful. Yeah. And I was never a huge Red Buttons fan, but I was after that night. Yeah. I, I mean, I didn't really have context for most of these guys till I started looking into like their yeah. careers. Red Buttons in the early 50s became the hottest comic on TV for one season. It went straight to his head. Oh, yeah? He fired everybody. He, he, there was a ad taken out in Variety as a joke at Christmas time, and it said, Merry Christmas, Red Buttons, from your writers. And it was a photo of 300 dudes. Oh, wow. <laughs> all of who had been fired. And he did. He had fired Larry Gelbart. He fired Neil Simon. He told them all that they weren't funny, and they were giving him shit when he went out on stage. But his show was number one in the ratings the year it premiered. He fired everybody, hired a whole new staff, and then it was like the bottom of the ratings in the second season and then canceled. But it went straight to his head. And then he was like real sheepish and apologetic after that to everybody trying to like gratiate himself now because he had no TV show. Then he got cast in a Marlon Brando movie, Sayonara, and he won an Academy Award. Right. And then it went straight to his head again. (laughs) He doesn't learn. Uh, He doesn't learn. Yeah. And so none of the comics could get a hold of him. He wouldn't return their call. (laughs) To hear the whole conversation, subscribe for free on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts or visit nevernotfunny.com.